Okay, we're going to get started here. I want to welcome everyone to this regular uh, meeting of the Board of Commissioners of the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority on this Thursday, August 25th, uh, a little afternoon. And if you could all rise and do the Pledge of Allegiance with us. I pledge, I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. And I will now call to order this meeting. And Madam Secretary, if you can please call the roll. Thank you. Chairperson Olivia Diaz. Present. Vice Chairperson William McCurdy. Present. Commissioner Scott Black. Here. Commissioner Valerie Craig. Commissioner Craig, you're on mute. Can you hear me now? Yes, thank you. Thank Commissioner you. Sharon Davis. Commissioner Michael Disman. Here. Commissioner Tick Sigerblum. Here. Commissioner Dan Shaw. Here. Commissioner Luciana Turner. A Here. quorum is present, and we are in compliance with the Nevada Open Meeting Law. Thank you, Commissioner Turner. Thank you, Ms. Reese. Um, we're going to move on to our second line of business, which is public comment. Public comment during this portion of the agenda must be limited to matters on this agenda for discussion and possible action. If you wish to be heard, come to the speaker's podium, clearly state your name and address, and spell your last name for the record. Any amount of time a single speaker is allowed will be limited to up to three minutes, and if any member of the board wishes to extend the length of a presentation, we can do this uh, through the chair or by board majority vote. Is there anyone wishing to step up to the podium to address any agenda items coming before us? Seeing none, we're going to move on to agenda item three, the approval of m the regular meeting minutes on July 21st, 2022. Are there any edits, comments, observations from the, the minutes? If not, I'll entertain a motion. Move to approve the minutes. I have a first from Commis Commissioner Sagerbloom and a second from Commissioner Desmond. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. We'll move on to agenda item four. Approval of this agenda with the inclusion of any emergency items and or deletions of any items or amendments. And I know we do have a modification to this agenda, correct, Mr. Jordan? Yes, Madam Chair. We respectfully request to have number 11 pulled so that staff and I can do further analysis on that proposal. All right. So currently we have this entire agenda minus we're going to strike agenda item 11. That's correct. Okay. Any other deletions or edits? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion to adopt the agenda as amended. Move for approval. I have a first by Commissioner Black and a second from Commissioner Sagerbloom. All those in favor, please signify by stating aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Motion carries. We're going to move on to the consent agenda items, number five and number six. And um, do we have anyone that has questions of the board of these consent agenda items or do do any of the board members wish to pull a consent agenda item forward for further debate or discussion? Seeing none, I'll entertain a motion on the consent agenda items. I'll move to approve the consent agenda. I have a first from Commissioner Shaw a and a second from Commissioner Desmond. Any conversation or debate about the motion? All those in favor, please signify by stating aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. We're going to move, uh, that concludes our consent agenda items, and we're moving on to Section 3, Commissioner's Executive Director's Recognitions. And so we'll go to you, Mr. Jordan, for acknowledgement of our departed. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'd like to acknowledge um, those residents who we've lost since our last uh, scheduled meeting. Uh, Diana Hunter Henry, Marilyn Wilkins, Kimberly Booker, Redessa Finley, Mary Miller, Leo Val Valencia, Richard Rizzo, Rita Cortez Mart Martinez, Plato Nicolias, Robert Mayo, and John Childress Jr. 
And so we can have a moment of silence. In addition, um, Lee Quick, who's a new employee I'll introduce in a moment, recently lost her sister-in-law. We wanted to keep her in our thoughts and prayers as well. Thank you. May they all rest in peace. Mm -hmm. um, we're moving on to agenda item eight, approval of resolution. So these are all separate agenda items that we'll discuss on their merits independently. So agenda item number eight, approval of resolution number SNRHA-119, our fiscal year 2023 annual plan. I'd like to bring Laura Raposi up to the podium to give the board a quick overview of the plan and the process that brought us to this resolution. Good afternoon, commissioners. Good My afternoon. name is Lori Raposa, um, RAPOSA. I am the agency's hearing officer and 504 compliance officer. Um, I'd first like to apologize for the, the dates on this agenda item. I gave Ms. Cynthia an incorrect date. Um, the, the plan, as is required by HUD, went out for 45-day public comment period on June 28, 2022. Um, not on August 25th, obviously. Um, public comment period also closed on with the public hearing that was held here in chambers on August 11th, 2022. Um, we published the, the public notices, went into um, multiple local um, newspapers and publications um, between June 16th and June 19th. Um, also, the plan and along with public notices and letters to explain what was going on were sent to all of the commissioners, all of the RAB members, and hard copies along with digital copies of the plan. Hard copies of the plan were distributed to all of the public housing offices and all of the administrative buildings with copies of the public notice was also distributed or notified Nevada Legal Services, the City of Las Vegas, and Clark County. Um, the City of Las Vegas and Clark County have both certified that our plan is in line with the strategic plan for the jurisdictions, and we have that documentation in your packet. Um, we all, we've included in today's board packet copies of the public comments that were received as well as the sign-in sheets for the meeting that was held with the RAB members on August 2nd and the public hearing that was held on August 11th. And if you don't have any questions, I'm set. Any questions from the board members? I just have one, Ms. Raposa. Was there okay. any significant amendments or changes made to the plan based on any input we received from residents? Um, all of the public comments that were received for the most part were from staff and that was in part through discussions with members that showed up at the, the RAB meeting um, and they were included in the packet. Okay. No further questions. I'll entertain a motion to adopt this fiscal year 2023 annual plan. Motion to adopt. So I have a first from Commissioner Black and a second from Commissioner Sagerbloom. All those in favor, please signify by stating aye. Aye. Any aye. opposed? Aye. Sounds like it's unanimous and it's approved. Uh, we'll move on to agenda item nine, approval of Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority's operating budget for fiscal year ending September 30th, 2023. Mr. Jordan? Yes. CFO Fred Heron will come up and address that issue. Good afternoon, commissioners. Fred Heron, director the Chief Administrative Officer of the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority. Welcome, Mr. Heron. Let's go, let's go. Okay, it's fine. Uh, today, I'm presenting to you the FY23 uh, fiscal budget for, for next year. Um, this budget was prepared um, by our pro property managers as well as our program directors. Uh, we received input from them. Um, to determine what would be how what would be needed to operate their fiscal year budget for next year, we anticipate having a residual receipts over expenditures in the amount of eight hundred and forty three thousand eight hundred and twenty four dollars for this upcoming fiscal year. Our conventional low end program is which consists of all of our asset management properties. We anticipate residual receipts in the amount of 
$108,200. Um, part of that increase is attributed to about $659,000 worth of dwelling, increase in dwelling rental. And those numbers are based on actuals, 22, fiscal year 2022 20, actuals. We are also anticipating having an increase in operating subsidy in the amount of 98% uh, proration rate for next this upcoming year, which is generated about an additional $274,000. Uh, one of the other highlights that um, that we noted in the budget, we we anticipate increasing in, in legal costs in the amount of thirty-five thousand dollars, and this is to help provide more representation to the managers when they when they appear in court, particularly when they're facing other attorneys, and this is as on an as-needed basis. Our central office call center, which represent all of our, our non-revenue producing call centers, finance, executive office, uh, HR, procurement, IT. Uh, we anticipate having an $18,884 receipts over expenditures. Uh, we are anticipating salary, administrative salaries increase by $524,000, and that was contributed that's based on four new positions that was requested by the departments, an executive administrative assistant, account specialist two, HR generalist, and a call center position uh, to assist our departments to, to operate more efficiently. Legal fees um, decrease in the central office budget for this upcoming fiscal year from $375,000 to $252, about $122,000 reduction. And it's based on fiscal, 22, fiscal year 2022 actuals. Uh, currently, to date, we spent approximately $182,000 in legal fees, leaving the balance about $150,000 to the end of September. Our Housing Choice Voucher Program, which is our largest program at our agency, uh, we anticipate having uh, residual seats over expenditures in the amount of $313,445. Uh, some of the major changes in this program, which we anticipate currently, as of July, we have, we've leased up 332 um, emergency, emergency housing vouchers. And we anticipate leasing up all 586 by the uh, next fiscal year, 2023, which is going to generate some additional half income um, in, in, in the EHP program, about, about four, a little over $4 million. Um, the Section 8 program has also put a new position in the budget, is, is requesting to put a new position in the budget, a landlord liaison uh, to assist them in addressing any landlord's concerns. Our affordable housing program. There was very much change in the affordable housing program budget from fiscal year 22 to fiscal year 23. Uh, we are projecting, and uh, the goal is to bring um, another item to the board next month to eliminate the debt on the Section 8 on the affordable housing program. Currently, we owe about $1.4 million in debt service to the, on the affordable housing properties, and the goal is to, to try to pay that off so we can save about $500,000 over the course of the next five years. One other highlight that we're going to be presenting in, in the next year's budget is, for the first time, our FSS program received um, more money than we have in, in previous years. In the previous year, we received about $700,000 uh, to pay for our salary benefits, benefits for our F FSS coordinators. This year, we received a little over a million dollars, um, which, which means that we won't be needing any money from the Section 8 program as well as the conventional low rate program to, to support uh, the FSS program. And our total agency budget is approximately $182 million for the upcoming fiscal year 2023. If you might have any questions, I'm ready to ask them. Um, I think Vice Chair McCurdy may have a question. Uh, thank you for the presentation. Can you please uh, go back over to the legal budget and, and how much we um, previously allocated and what savings there were, or if there were any? The legal budget, the total amount of budget was, was for, the, for the legal program was uh, $375,000 in, in our central office call center. And to date, we've spent, we reduced, in, in the upcoming budget, we reduced that amount to $252,000. This is based on current spending. Um, it's about $122,000 less from, from this current year's budget. But as of as I stated, as of July 2022, our legal costs 
we've incurred $182,690, leaving the balance about $150,000 for the next couple of months through September 30th, 2022. Just to clarify, I think those numbers do not include Mr. Parker. This is Mr. Parker's bill. And so this, this, this is all in Mr. Parker's so, bill. So you've just broken it out by property? No, this is, this is, this is total cost of repayment to Parker for the course of this fiscal year from October 1 to so July 2022. Review for me again what the total amount is we've paid out to date. 182,000. Okay. And that's for one year? That's for from October 1 right. of 2021 to July uh, 2022. Thank you for the clarification. Okay. Are there any questions? Any other questions about the budget? Sue somebody got money. Okay. <laughs> oh my goodness, <laughs> Commissioner Sager Bloom. <laughs> we have enough of those to deal with. I know Mr. Parker. Plate is plentiful. <laughs> Any other questions? I want to be respectful of uh, commissioners that are online. Uh, Commissioner Turner, Commissioner Craig. Any questions? I have one. Can you hear me? Yeah. Can you speak a little bit either closer? You kind of sound far away. Okay, this is Commissioner Craig. Can you hear me now? Yes, go ahead. All right, my question is, I understand you're putting, get, getting funding for uh, someone to work in the call center. And my question is, I've received quite a few complaints from individuals regarding the call center and their non-responsiveness are either their rudeness. And my question is, is there really going to be activated and real training for the individuals that they get? Because, you know, we live in Jamestown Tower, and it's not the most, let me say, well-built building. And we have quite a few complaints, but I get quite a few complaints about their non-responsiveness. Commissioner, we're reassessing the whole call center process. You know, from a budget standpoint, if, in fact, we determine that another body is needed, we'll put one in it. And we want it to, you know, bring that to the, to the commissioners as a possibility, but I, I understand exactly what you're saying. Um, we've gone from three members in the call center to we have a, uh, in providing service Monday through Thursday and obviously emergency service on the weekends. Uh, we've acquired a vendor who's now supporting the call center and uh, receiving calls uh, Monday through Friday. So there's a lot of work we're doing there but just for the sake of budgeting, we wanted to add that position, or at least make you aware that we're adding that position. But I am very cognizant of the, some of the issues that, um, that we, we may be facing. The vendor that we brought on board is giving us uh, monthly reports showing things like average hold time, average abandonment, and things of that nature. So we're, we're vigilant around that issue. Thank you. You're welcome. And if, uh, I see Commissioner Turner also may have a question. Commissioner Turner. Can you hear me? Yes, mm -hmm. yes ma'am. Hello. Yes, we can yes. hear you. Okay, thank you. Um, I guess this would be for the finance officer, uh, Mr. Herod. Um, I honestly would like to know more about, I guess, the interpretation of the data. Because what I see in the beginning, opening the approved budget for 2022, and this is by each program, is that correct? 22 by each program, yes. Or yes. 76. And it looks like we're spending less because it dropped down to, for this fiscal year, at $143,824. Is that correct? I can, can you pre repeat that number again? And I, in, in the opening statement, with the approved budget for last year was $961,476. Yes. And to me, it looks like we're spending less, if I'm just looking at this data correct, at $843,824. Well, the $843,000 represent how much money we would have left over after we do all our expenditures. So 
in theory, I guess what you would say we would probably be spending more because we had more money budgeted left over in the fiscal year 22 than we're projecting in fiscal year 23. Okay. I, I didn't understand the interpretation of those numbers exactly because I was following along. But I would like to spend a little bit more time, Director, um, if you could maybe one day kind of explain how everything is for the Board of Directors so we kind of understand um, the numbers and the data and what you use to get these numbers. I think we're we'll, up there. But we'll get something on the calendar, Commissioner. Thank you. And we can give you just uh, maybe a tutorial and uh, a better, clear, more clear understanding of the numbers. Yes. Thank you. So we can do that immediately. You're welcome. I have a question, Mr. Heron. So how are we prepared as an agency? I know that everything obviously is increasing in cost. Um, we hear about this rate going up, that rate going up as an agency. How are we prepared to shore up uh, expenses that might continue to add up over time because we see water, energy, sewer rates, all of these other things um, increase. So I just didn't know how do you, we prepared for the delta change. Can you? Well, well actually, for the, we, we've been very fortunate, as you may see, for the, for the past several years. We've been receiving more money in our agency than we have since the years, since I've been here for more than my 30 years. Um, this budget right here shows the budget projection of about 843000 after expenses. But I, I really anticipate, you know, we probably we have more savings than, that, than we were projecting in the operating budget. I don't anticipate, anticipate us spending all the items that we do in the operating budget as we normally don't. Um, so, but so currently, I think we, we're in a pretty good shape. Good. So we have, we've padded some areas just to account for we, we, some potential. As we hear about all, everyone's all, woes with supply chain and things being increasingly more expensive to repair and to replace, we've accounted for that in this all, budget. All of, our, all of our property managers, and I don't like using the word pad, but Put additional money in to kind of cover expenses that they may may see in the future. I know pad doesn't sound great, <laughs> but sometimes we have to put a little more cha-ching in there to make things happen. And on a quarterly basis, we sit down and, and look at numbers very carefully. So you know, we look to see actuals versus uh, expected, and and make adjustments accordingly. Good to know. All right. I don't see any further questions from the board. There are no um, further questions. I move for approval. I have a motion to approve this um, operating budget from Vice Chair McCurdy. Second. And a second from um, Commissioner Black. All those in favor, please signify by stating aye. 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 Any opposed? Was that an aye, Commissioner Turner, or was that an opposed? Okay, she's, she's for it. Okay. <laughs> Moves uh, unanimous, unanimously forward. We're going to move to agenda item 10, approval to revise various contracts for fiscal year 2022. Johnny Shaw from our procurement department will speak to this item. Good afternoon, commissioners. Johnny Shaw, procurement manager. Good afternoon. Uh, we're bringing uh, four contracts uh, to the board for increases. Uh, first contract is lawyer mechanical services for our chillers and boilers. Uh, the second is national credit reporting. Um, the third is uh, Yellowstone landscape. And the fourth is uh, Sonatrol. And the, uh, the chart is in your, uh, in your backup. Any questions for Mr. Shaw from the board? So the credit reporting, is that, do we do credit background checks before people come into the, our units? Yes. We, we don't charge them to pay for their own credit report, do we? No. no. That I'm not sure. No, we don't. Yeah. Good, thank you. Vice Chair McCurdy. Yes, can we just speak to uh, the Yellowstone landscape? Has yes. there been a revision in the scope of work? Um, we have, uh, we actually have, uh, we have two landscape companies. Um, and uh, most of the budget, most of the operating budget was, uh, was earmarked for our primary landscaping company. Uh, and so due to the increase in work, due to the REAC uh, preparation, 
uh, we moved, uh, we're moving that budget, half of that budget over to the, to the Yellowstone contract, but it's still within the budget. And what is typically um, outlined within the contract for response times, just, you know, uh, weekly maintenance, what does that look like? Well, I don't understand What does question. it look like in terms of the contract? Is it a weekly maintenance? Um, you know, just what does their scope of work consist of? I believe it is weekly maintenance, yes, for all the properties. Got it. Through September. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, and I just want to highlight that some of these contracts don't end at the end of the fiscal year. Some of them end until 2024. I'm seeing the Sonitrol doesn't end until 26. So Correct. is that accurate, Mr. Shaw, that some of yes. these contracts are for multiple years versus Correct. a fiscal year? Correct. Okay. Um, everything looks good. I would just say in terms of the landscape being that, you know, we do hear a lot from some of the constituents within the properties that, uh, we maintain a high level of communication with them in terms of their responsiveness to us. And uh, if we have any issues, please bring it back forward. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay. Any further questions? I see Commissioner Turner's hand up. Um, okay. So with the, the alarm company. Yes. Um, I've heard several complaints. I don't know, I mean, from the residents that have been presented to the board about their safety and, and the alarm, uh, the security. Now, I'm not sure if they're also subcontracted, but I would just like to know um, the effectiveness of this alarm company that we're hiring because of the money that we're spending with them. Um, are we really getting what we pay for? Are, are the residents really receiving that security that they need? Because we've had several, several, several residents, properties that have been at risk. And I just want to make sure we're spending our money in the right way with the right security company. So the, al the alarm and security, those are two separate contracts. Uh, the alarm company, uh, they monitor uh, our, exec our administrative buildings here downtown and at Flamingo. Thank you for the clarification. And I, I just wanted to add not only to this question, but to, to, to all of the, the commissioners. You know, in order for us to properly manage both contracts and our day-to-day our -day, uh, operation, feedback is such a gift to us. So commissioners, to the extent that you know, you're hearing issues from either residents or other constituents, I, I would invite you to feed that information directly to me. And then I can parse it out and give you a, a formal response. And for the most part, I do get that. But uh, clearly understanding Commissioner's point, we want to make sure we're spending public money the right way. And uh, we have a, a number of tracking mechanisms to determine quality of work. But I think one of the most significant ones is putting it back on my lap to address. And so if we could, you know, I think there was an earlier comment that suggested some other issues that one of the commissioners were hearing. Please forward that information to me. Thank you. Uh, Vice Chair McCurdy. There are no further questions. I move for approval. I have a first to approve um, agenda item number 10, which is to revise various contracts for the fiscal year 2022. Second. And I have a second from Commissioner Black. All those in favor, please signify by stating aye. Aye. Any opposed? Aye. Motion carries unanimously. All right. Um, we, uh, agenda item 11 is stricken from the agenda, so we're going to move on to receive reports from our executive director on administrative and operational activities of our agency. Thank you, Madam Chair. I just have a few things to announce this, this uh, month. Um, we're still moving uh, forward on the CNI process, having meetings uh, as it relates to the redevelopment of um, Marble Manor and the Stuart West Side. I mentioned in our last report that um, HUD approved the, um, the requisition for us to solicit vendors to participate in our project-based voucher program. Um, in a line with that, 
we're working on doing a, a developer conference, if you will, and uh, we're in the process of moving forward, and um, we're, we're, we're calling a short time out to get all of the jurisdictions involved. So if you can imagine, and I'll meet with you all individual to um, look to see what's going on in your areas. Um, I'm looking to bring developers in locally and from around the country, both in person and virtually, to really talk about creating a greater partnership with the Housing Authority and with the municipalities. So I'll be reaching out to you to um, just get some, some information and feedback on who are on your teams that I should be in touch with to do this. Uh, the city of Las Vegas has graciously um, um, said that they would host, City Hall will host it, but we're a regional housing authority and we appreciate that effort, but we wanna make sure that we show that it's not just the housing authority and the uh, city of Las Vegas. So that's something that's forthcoming soon. Uh, in addition to that, um, Mr. Jordan, the board members are um, interested and want to inquire, do we have a, a, a date in mind? We, we do not have a date right now because we were, as we were moving forward, you know, we, we looked and initially the, after pulling something together, it didn't look as regional as we wanted it to look. So I, I would anticipate that before the end of the year, um, the uh, project-based voucher RFP is on the street, and we're looking to see who responds to that, and we wanted it to kind of coincide. So I, I would say this is, um, we're in September now, somewhere in the, in the fourth quarter of the year, we're looking to do it. And it would include staff talking about the HUD products like project-based vouchers, um, you as board members talking about the, the need for not only affordable housing, but housing in general, we'll look to have to see from both the local, the state, and the federal level how we can show some strategic alignment in addressing the serious housing need we have in the community. Yeah. Very Thank good. You. Um, in addition to that, I wanted to introduce uh, Lee Quick. I'll just ask Lee to stand up. Lee's our new resident services manager. Um, Tracy Torrance, who held that position for a while, retired. And um, Lee was the selection with Tracy leaving. Uh, Lee worked for us before. We, uh, she's coming to us from the city of Las Vegas. And um, we see some, a tremendous amount of added value there because a lot of the things we're working on, she was working on on the city side. So um, we, we, we see a tremendous opportunity to continue to um, do things we're doing. And equally as important, you know, a vision for that department is to grow the availability of opportunities for the residents we serve. You know, if you recall in my interview, I talked a lot about connecting our residents to, um, to resources, you know, be it the work we're doing with the Workforce Connection, education, um, health, employment, all of those things, bridging those gaps so that we can help to support people move towards self-sufficiency. So we're, we're glad to have Lee on board. Welcome, Ms. Quick. Thank you. Um, I know they did an amazing steal from the city of Las Vegas, so. <laughs> but I'm happy to be able to um, work with you in this vein, so yeah. welcome. And then the other thing I wanted to uh, uh, announce, um, with some reservation, um, Cynthia Reese joined us in the beginning of the year. Uh, Cynthia came over from education, and uh, she's decided that that's where she wants to be. So today will be Cynthia's last board meeting, and she's going to pursue other interests in her field of education support. And so I just wanted to acknowledge and thank Cynthia for all of her support and her contributions. And while we're gonna miss her, I wanted to introduce Jessica Walker, who's coming over from our operations side, who will now be my new executive assistant, who, um, and we're, we're, we're pleased to have her on the team as well. Well, thank you, Ms. Reese, for your diligence while well, you've uh, helped us along the way these last few months, and we look forward to working with you, Ms. Walker. 
And that concludes my report. Now I'd like to have, Martha, you want to introduce our guests? Okay. Martha Floor is going to introduce our community guests today. Thank you, Martha. <clears throat> didn't grow stilts, Tommy. <laughs> Good afternoon, commissioners. I'm Martha Floyd, resident program coordinator. Um, one of the exciting parts of my job is that I get to build relationships with our community partners, and it is my honor to introduce a couple of them to you today. First off, I want to introduce Ms. Tamika Henry from the Oboto Collective. Ms. Henry is actually a product of our FSS program. Welcome, Ms. Henry. Welcome. I'm, I'm. <laughs> Thank you for welcoming me, Madam Chair and members of the board. My name is Tamika Henry. I'm the executive director of the Abodo Collective. I, like she said, was a participant in the FSS program and know the grand benefits of it for the residents. So I'm glad to be back here in this capacity and just sharing some of the work that we do with the Aboto Collective. We are a small nonprofit organization that was birthed out of the needs um, of the pandemic. Um, within our first operation year, I, I was brought on in May of 2021 and my food programs coordinator, her name is Cheyenne Kyle. I'm sorry that she couldn't be here, but we've been doing um, tremendous work in the historic west side of Las Vegas. Our focus um, has been housing, has been food security, and also access to um, quality, high quality early childhood education for our youngest citizens. Um, so we do work within black and brown communities. We have been vetting existing nonprofits and organizations just to ensure that they're doing what they say that they're going to do. Because when we give someone a referral, we wanna make sure that you are providing the services and also that you have what you need um, to provide those services. So one thing that's unique about us not only are we helping the citizens, we help those nonprofit organizations as well because we don't want to reinvent the wheel. There's already something out there that's working. What resources do you need to keep going? Um, and also our main motto is basically to um, get help and give help. Um, and so we really work through existing relationships that we have with community organizations, individuals, and elected officials. Um, we host community engagement events. We work directly with neighbors to provide assistance. And we have facilitated um, supply drops, be that food um, and any supplies that are needed. So a lot of these are just pictures of us doing the work throughout the community. Of course, um, working with Congressman Horsford, yeah, just all of this. It's like a yearbook for me. It's like a yearbook of all the work that we've done and events that we've either attended or um, have spoken at and with community engagement. So we are building a community garden on the historic west side at 1300 C Street. It's at C in Monroe. And it will be a garden. We'll have a small green grocer on site. We will offer um, nutrition education classes as well as gardening classes so um, those who want to learn how to garden can do so and more pictures just out in the community even partnerships with um, Metro um, they have a toy drive every year we were able to deliver those toy items directly to residents also with the solidarity food um, pantry we deliver food to different pantries that may need as well. And just more pictures, you gotta love it. Um, direct impact with our neighbors included. Um, we were able to, sorry, we were able to adopt during the holidays. There was a young citizen who was, um, was involved in a hit and run accident on Halloween night. And I was able to work with that family and other community organizations to adopt that family during the holidays, made sure that they had food, gifts, but also connecting them to resources such as victims of crime so they can um, 
So they were able to get those medical bills paid for, but also the family was able to take off work to um, tend to the child as she was going through her healing journey. So those are some things that we do, like we'll share the resources, but also follow up with them to make sure that it worked for them. Um, another thing, when the pandemic happened, a lot of the hotels um, did shut down. Um, and this one household, she had been on her job for about 23 years um, with the local casino. Um, unemployment was running out had a family member, her brother, that she ended up taking into her home. He has a permanent um, disability. He's quadriplegic. And I was telling her that there are other um, career opportunities and pathways out there, um, maybe looking to becoming a, a CNA or um, home health care provider. And so she went through that certification process and was able to not only care for her brother, but was able to bring on other clients as well, thus increasing her um, income again and continuing to be self-sufficient. So we helped her by paying for her work card, her TB testing, um, even her clothing um, that she needed. And we were able to give her a referral for mortgage assistance so she can get back on track. So. That's who we are, um, different supply drops that we did. It was, and at that time we were a small and mighty team of two, but we were able to do it and make impact um, throughout our community. So this is the proposed site of the garden. Um, looks a little different now because our fencing just went up this week and they're working on the irrigation now. And we are hoping to be I have a soft opening by October. So in the meantime, we've also been working with the resident council at Marble Manor. Um, they have expressed a want and a need for a community garden or plots there. We've been able to um, provide all of the supplies and so hoping to work with, um, with the resident council, with the authority to make sure that we have um, all the proper uh, make sure the land is graded and ready and irrigation and we're ready. We're ready. I already have volunteers who are ready to build the boxes. They'll be above ground and we'll still continue to do our monthly um, nutrition education classes, um, our, our Eat to Live series, and it would be great to just go out there, harvest vegetables, bring them in and show them how to prep them. So that's who we are, the Abodo Collective. Um, last year, we were able to impact about 517 um, individuals. Um, about $72,000 was spent directly back into the community. And it was everything from childcare, education, food, household items, housing. Um, we even assisted with refugees as well. So if you have any questions, I'm Tamika Henry. I do have my cards available. And I'm looking forward to a continued partnership with the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Henry. <laughs> Any questions? Okay, I see none. Thank you for all the work. It truly does take a village to Absolutely. raise our kids and be supportive of each other. So thank you. Thank you so much. Have a great one. You too. I know we have someone else, Ms. Floyd. Can you come and present our second presenter? <laughs> Okay, there's just a slight change. Um, your agenda says Gladys Barrios, who isn't here today, but in her place we have Elise Apricio, and this is from the CSN Adult Career Education Services Program. Um, I'm not gonna steal her thunder and tell you what they do. Hello there, thank you. Um, Thank you for having me here, chairperson, members of the board. Um, my name is Elise. I have lots of flyers, so I came prepared. Uh, I am one of the advisors with CSN's Adult Career Education Services. So we're grant funded by the Department of Education to offer a free ESL, English as a Second Language, and high school equivalency classes for adults in the Valley. Uh, we've been around in, in different names since uh, for about 20 years or so. Uh, and in the last few years, we've actually partnered with some agencies to provide 
um, vocation specific training in high demand career fields such as manufacturing, um, dialysis patient care technician, uh, community health worker, and uh, forklift. Um, and we've, that's been very successful. We've been doing that for the last few years. And we're looking for more students. We have uh, students all throughout the valley uh, in Henderson, North Las Vegas, Vegas, all over. Um, I know we have classes about to run at the historic Westside School. So we're, we're all over. Um, we have class availability in the morning and in the evening. Um, and so it's really, the schedule is there for um, our, our population usually works. So it's either before work or after work. Uh, they can come to an uh, information session. We do that every Monday at 11 a.m. and at 4 p.m. We do an information session at our Sahara West Center, which is our main location. And in that session, we talk about our classes, what we offer, and um, students have an opportunity to ask questions. Uh, then they take an assessment. Uh, it's the TABE assessment to see where they are with their adult basic skills. After taking that assessment, they meet with an advisor. Uh, we, assess, we go over the results with them, talk about their goals, talk about what they would want to do, what they hope to do. Uh, many of our students, especially during the pandemic, decided, hey, I want to get retrained. Maybe I want to go into a new field. Maybe their um, job was eliminated during the pandemic and they're looking for a new opportunity. So we've had a lot of different uh, people enter in new fields. Um, and then they join our short-term trainings. So we've, uh, depending on the training, it could be about four to 20 weeks long. And uh, we have them starting, we had some start this month, uh, but we have st stuff happening ongoing. We have um, different cohorts throughout the year. And um, that's pretty much in a nutshell. And like, hopefully I covered everything. Uh, I have lots of flyers that have our uh, contact information, our front desk, our email. Um, we have social media, so um, people that can interact with us, uh, they can get more information about what we offer. Thank you. Is there any questions? Vice Chair Sorry. has a comment. Yes. Go ahead, Vice Chair McCurdy. No, I was just um, just stating to our chair that you know this is you know a phenomenal opportunity that we have you know with the work that not only you're doing with than you know, your role at CSN, but also uh, the different types of collaborations that we are uh, bringing to fruition uh, to include the Workforce Connections uh, Board and, and, and now the Abodo Project and so many others. So I'd, I'm just, you know, just commenting that I'm really excited about uh, our ability to really merge the different agencies with the supportive agencies of the community uh, to really get our communities back to a place of self-sufficiency. So I just, you know, just want to thank you for your work, but also was coming to the chairwoman uh, how you know excited I am for what will be due to our efforts. Awesome, thank you. Any further comments? And I just want to piggyback on that and say that um, I think that a lot of folks through the pandemic kind of realized that change can happen at any time and mm -hmm. sometimes we need the forcefulness of uh, mm -hmm. just um, a really difficult situation to kind of get us to make that leap of faith and know that we do have uh, amazing partners that uh, are offering a plethora of services to our community, but sometimes our community isn't even aware that those right. services are accessible to them for, for, for free. Mm -hmm. Basically, they just have to show up, they have to want to do something else and, you know, take their path a different way. Um, so I just want to recognize all the work CSN does in helping our adult population that sometimes have non-traditional pathways, but doesn't mean yes. we have to be set on those pathways forever. And, I believe that we are, we are each kind of in the driver's seat of our future, and mm -hmm. we want to see all community members on a pathway to economic prosperity. And right. we know that right now so many of in our community work two and three jobs to keep the roof mm -hmm. over their heads, mm -hmm. to pay the bills, to clothe their kids, but there are opportunities that mm -hmm. can put them on a one job, good um, wrap around benefits and you know give them that self-sufficiency that I think just at the end of the day we want to just make sure we're taking care of our own right exactly exactly yeah so thank you so much Elise for thank you uh, I look forward to receiving those flyers because I know our office can definitely put them to work where do I put these today um, you can leave them with the secretaries and they can distribute them to us thank you so much. Thank you. All right with that is that the last 
presentation, Mr. Jordan. Do you have any final comments? Yes, I did have one other acknowledgement I'd like to make. Uh, under the category of project-based vouchers, if you all recall, um, we can issue vouchers to um, developers or to organizations that have already received pre-approval from HUD on projects that they have in place. And I'm pleased to announce that uh, we're going to issue 25 project-based vouchers to a development called Haven Village Phase 1 out in Mesquite. And so there will be the recipients of 25 vouchers. We have Ms. Sean Hurst on, uh, online right now. And I kept looking like, where do I know this person from? <laughs> Ms. Sean is the deputy director up in Mesquite. But here again, just, just another way of partnering. And as you know, with project-based vouchers, it, it allows us to um, support our partners in, um, in rural in their efforts to put more, um, more units into, into the affordable pipeline. So I just wanted to acknowledge um, the fact that we're doing that. Thank you. Any comments since they've hung with us all the meeting? Michelle, would you like to comment? No, thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, um, Executive Director Jordan. Just very excited about the partnership and really appreciate the collaboration to provide project-based vouchers to our project in Mesquite. Awesome. Making the good work happen. Thank you. Absolutely. Madam Chair, that concludes my report. All right. And with that, um, <coughs> any thing the board members want to bring up before I open it to public comment? Yes, Commissioner. Oh, I don't know before public comment, but I just want to... I don't want the meeting to end without me personally thanking uh, Cynthia, who has really helped me to navigate through being a new commissioner and, and the ups and downs. And I actually threatened to file suit against her for abandonment that she's leaving, <laughs> <laughs> that she's leaving us. But she refused to respond. I think so. Ms. Walker can adopt you <laughs> and well, her absence. Say, yes, Ms. Walker? Well, okay. I think I look at it as a baton. She's passing it on, and, I, and she promised she'd make sure that it's passed on with a qualified person that's willing to really put up with me and arrest the commissioners who have various uh, problems and situations, and she has just been unbelievable. Thank you. So I just want you to know it's greatly appreciated. God bless you. Okay. Commissioner Sagerman? Yes, I just wanted to follow up on... Uh, your idea of trying to get more vouchers from from Washington and how we can help and where we're at on that. Well, we're still uh, pursuing those efforts. Uh, a couple months ago, uh, I think it was Vice Chairman McCurdy who convened folks from D.C. to just talk about this whole notion of the, um, the, the distribution model. You know, as we currently know, and I think it bears repeating, you know, we've seen tremendous growth here in the region over the last 20 plus years, but the formula for distribution of vouchers has stayed the same. So we have around 12,500 vouchers for back then maybe 400,000 people where our population has grown, you know, to 2.3, 2.4, or three, is it 2.3 million? I'm correct there. Chicago has a population of 2.7 proper and they get 48,000 vouchers. So we've talked to HUD. Uh, we had the pleasure of meeting with the secretary of HUD. And so, you know, we'll, we'll continue to follow up and we'll continue to build the business case for a greater distribution. With that being said, I'm, I'm very proud of staff and the fact that whenever they're, we call them boutique vouchers, whenever they're available, we apply and we've been very fortunate in getting it. Uh, we talked about emergency housing vouchers. These are vouchers that are addressing the homeless population. Um, we're, I would like to say we're pretty much setting a pace countrywide through our partnership with the county and COC and housing families and things of that nature. Um, additionally, Commissioner, uh, one of the things I'll bring forward to the board over the next couple of months is a, um, a strategy to attract and retain more landlords. You know, that's something that's worked for me in the past. We can get vouchers. I mean, right now, we have approximately 400 people with vouchers in hand out on the street. And unfortunately, we don't have landlords that are saying, yes, we'll take them. 
uh, in my past housing assignments, uh, I was very successful in developing strategies in the way of partnerships with landlords to help them understand that investing in the housing authority and in the Section 8 process is a very healthy, um, not only from a community perspective, but also from a financial perspective. And so I'll bring back and looking to collaborate with not only this board, but the jurisdictions to come up with a pot, if you will. This is something HUD won't fund, but some incentives to help landlords, you know, take, take on that responsibility of renting units to folks who are local who need them and, um, and incre increasing the probability of us housing folks. So that's something I'll follow up on. Great, because I mean, you have some real powerhouses here, so let's yes. take advantage of it. Very much. Thank you. Any other issues or comments any board members wants to make at this time? Seeing none, we're going to move on to the, com the last period for public comment, comments by the general public. Items raised under this portion of the agenda cannot be deliberated or acted upon by the Board of Commissioners for the Southern Nevada Regional Housing Authority until the notice provisions of the open meeting law have been complied with. If you wish to speak on matters not listed on this posted agenda, please step up to the podium and clearly state your name and address and spell your last name for the record. And uh, is there any public comment? Yes, we have one gentleman. My name is Bud Simpson. I live at Saratini Plaza, 900 Brush. Chase worker, Daniel Kane, took $832 of my food stamps and transferred them to down in California May the 19th. Then he turned around October 1st, he lodged a $300 cash advance at my bank account. So Mr. Jordan, um, just for clarity, is, is this caseworker an employee of the Housing Authority? The caseworker, Daniel Kane. Okay. Yeah, we'll, right. we'll, we'll meet with the gentleman right after the meeting. Okay. And get some clarity there. Yes, sir, we'll meet with you right after the meeting. After the meeting? Right, yes. right away, immediately. Two, yes. There's some employees that can come and um, yeah. get more information from we'll you. We'll get more information from you. Yeah. Okay, well, you know what? If you, we'll have someone talk to you right now. Yeah, Amber, would you? You said Sartini. It's actually Lee. Lee, okay, Lee will talk with you right now. <laughs> but we're on it. John Johnson for the record. Um, first thing I actually want to comment on your program that you're trying to put together uh, for the housing choice vouchers. That's a much needed program. Um, being a housing choice voucher recipient, I know the problems of having to go and look for housing. And time and time again, there's not enough landlords who accept Section 8 housing or they say, oh yeah, we accept it, but you have to have this type of credit score. Well, if I had that type of credit score, I wouldn't need help, like, you know. But um, actually educating the landlords and telling them the advantages of Section 8 and stuff like that, I think will be very, very beneficial. But to uh, talk about what I came here for, I would like to pass this to the board members. So I filed a complaint with the Attorney General's office concerning the open meeting law about the committees. They did a finding of fact and said, yes, you guys violated the open meeting law. At that time, at that board meeting, uh, your attorney said that um, he was sending out a letter to respond to that finding. Well, this is a direct response to that letter that uh, Mr. Parker sent to the Attorney General's office. And once again, they are standing with the facts and saying that you guys violated open meeting law by not having your subcommittees follow the open meeting law procedures. I'll tell you guys again and again, 
your committees have to follow the open meeting law. It's not ambiguous. It's very clear. If majority of the members are members of the original body or staff members, they have to follow open meeting law. If the body has the ability to make recommendations to the existing body, they have to follow open meeting law. You guys had a resident advisory board meeting on the second. They made an action to approve the financial budget that you guys just approved. That RAD board is supposed to follow open meeting law. I don't understand why it's so difficult, but I emailed the executive director and I'm letting you guys know that I filed another complaint with the attorney general's office because you guys once again violated the open meeting law. So can we please start following the open meeting law and allow the subcommittees to be open to the public? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Johnson. Any further public comment? Phyllis Carpenter, 5200 Alpine. You know, I don't like to get up here every month and, and complain. I really don't. But um, recently, I had to recertify. Um, they don't do any, any in-office certifications. You have to stand at the window and do your paperwork, which is really rude. Um, there's always a line of people behind you. It's just not right. Um, so when I went to recertify, I turned my paperwork in on the 27th. <coughs> I received a letter on the 10th that was post dated the 9th, but it was actually dated the 3rd. Okay, and it said, so that left me three, three days, no, four business days to come up with whatever papers it was that they needed. So I went to the window and I was like, I told, I told the lady at the window, Nora, about it. She's like, what, what do you want me to do? I can't control the mail. I said, no, but what you can control is that Pitney Bowles machine with the postmark date on it. You know, and she, um, she continued to be rude. So I went to take out my phone to start recording. And she said, if, if, I, if I record that, she wasn't going to process my paperwork. Um, that, it, that's not right. OK, so then um, I received a 30-day notice because um, in June, I, I'm no longer working. I had a lot of family problems last month. I lost the son of my father. My sister was hit by a car. My other sister has stage four cancer. So there's a lot of stuff going on with me. And um, I, so I'm no longer working. Um, they served me a 30 day notice to pay or quit. I'll pay the $108, but at this time, I'm not registered with, with the rent cafe. They went through and they registered everybody else, why I didn't get whatever. And now, because I'm trying to do it on my phone, I've been trying for over a week now to get on the app and or whatever to be able to register and I can't it won't do it from my phone um, I went to Nikki I think we I met with her last Thursday and Nikki um, I seen her on Monday because I still can't log in and I asked her about it in the hallway and she looked at me she acknowledged me and then she turned around and walked away and it was like I asked the lady that was nice to me I go did you was I not clear you know and it's just and the resident council thing. They pushed me off the council board again. They said that, that even though my position is good for one year, they have nominations for my position to fill in, which it's asinine to me the way that they, they do it. And the last time you guys did it, I filed a complaint with HUD. They said that it wasn't discrimination, but there was numerous other violations to the regulations and that I had two years to the date to file in the federal court. I did go file in July and I'm sure that I can get an extension because of the COVID. And, and not to mention, I have a disability. So it's hard for me to even sit down and write out a complaint. And so I plan on going and doing that this week because this is not right. Every time I get on a resident council and and she told me the new lady what's her name miss lee she told me what are you afraid that they're not going to elect you why why do i even need to be elected again i my position is good until march i don't know what else to say 
I'm sorry you've been going through so much, Ms. Carpenter. And again, Mr. Jordan, if sure, we'll we can continue look to in. find ways to better communicate with Ms. Carpenter. Okay. Thank you. Any other person here for public comment? Seeing none, this meeting is adjourned. <laughs>